Okay, so let's take a look at the areas that we would assess for when we want to verify the venous sinus system. So remember, we talked about different steps in our protocol in a previous slide, but I'm going to review them with you now so you can see them yourself. So first what we're going to do is we're going to examine the sutures. Remember that suture immobility means that the dura mater is immobile, right? So venous drainage can be impaired in those regions. Assessing and decompacting the sutures is going to be key to a facilitating cranial venous drainage. Next, we're going to palpate for the cranial base, right? We're going to look to see whether or not the occiput is going to be immobile or compacted. Are the suboccipital muscles dense or rigid? We're going to verify to see whether or not the occiput has full range of motion and flexion and extension. Is it stuck in internal rotation and flexion, whereby this area can't open out and drain? And we're also going to verify the temporals. Remember we said that if the temporals are stuck in internal rotation, it can impede drainage into the jugular and corroded veins and arteries. And we're also going to want to get a bit of an idea of whether or not there's any immobility in the thoracic region. Okay, so let's start. So first what I'm going to do with my client is I'm just going to verify sutures overall. Remember we found that there was an area right about here, right where the coronal and the sagittal sutures meet. And so we're going to need to take some time to be able to open out and treat that area with that technique that I showed you in previous chapters on how to decompact a suture. So in our assessment, we found that the intersection point of the coronal and sagittal suture needs treatment. We need to decompact that area. That's also going to be an important area in making sure that the vault is able to move properly. Remember we talked about the importance of the meninges being able to move, thereby allowing cerebrospinal fluid to circulate. So opening up this area here is going to be one of our first key points on her in terms of facilitating venous drainage. Next, what are we going to do is we're going to check our cranial base. So once again, I'm going to take my client's head and what did we say that we found that there was quite a bit of suboccipital compaction. That even within posture, look, as I try to bring her into flexion, I really have to force with my fingers a lot. So in a case like this, it's important to make note of the fact that there is a lot of dense tissue in this important area of drainage where the third and fourth ventricles are located. We're going to want to make a note of that because the tissues need to be released and decompacted. And also, we're going to listen for the occiput, the bone itself, in terms of its movement in flexion and extension. And remember, we said that she seems to go well into flexion, but not so much into extension. And the key to a CV4 is actually ensuring that we can release the area so that it can open out so that cerebrospinal fluid can drain. So an occiput that is somewhat stuck in flexion, not coming fully into extension, which is the case with her, is actually also a sign of poor venous drainage. So we're going to need to do a CV4 definitely on her to open up this area. Also, we're going to check the region anterior to the mastoid. Remember we said that now, once the fluid comes out of the third and fourth ventricle, it now needs to drain down in an oblique manner this way. So hardened tissues or the mastoid being stuck in internal rotation is also going to be important for us. So very often what I like to do is just get in anterior to the mastoid and see whether or not am I able to mobilize them. Am I able to kind of reach in and pull it into extension? And I find that on the right side, remember we noticed that her temporal bone seemed to be stuck a little bit in internal rotation. Well, sure enough, when I try to grab that mastoid and bring it back into external rotation, it doesn't want to go as much. So the fact that our temporal bone on the right side is stuck in internal rotation more than the left is also going to be an important factor in terms of verifying for potential drainage through the anterior portion of the neck. So I start in the temporal area, but then I also like to palpate just right under the jawline here, as you can see where my fingers are, 
and work my way down obliquely as if I was following the sternoclatomastoid muscles. And ironically, what I'm finding on her is that those muscles are actually a little bit more rigid on the left side. So we have a lot of uneven balances, cross compensation patterns going on. We're going to need to work to soften the muscles on her right side. See how her left, she seems to flex quite well, but on her left side, not as much. So regardless of the techniques you're using, if you're a massage therapist, there's a lot of work you can do in through here. If you want to work with reflex points, there's many different ways that you can work to soften up the tissues here. We're also then lastly going to verify the upper thoracic area. Remember we said it's into here that the fluid drains. So one thing that I like to do as an osteopath, I'm preoccupied with bones, so the first thing that I do is I verify for mobility of the clavicles. In osteopathy, mobility of the clavicles and the first and second rib are going to be key in ensuring that there's proper drainage in this area. There's also the anterior fascia, there's also muscles, many different structures that you might need to open up in the anterior thoracic area as well. So our assessment is going to consist of verifying the sutures. Why? Because sutures, when they're compacted, they inhibit the movement of the dura. When the dura can't move, then we can't have movement of fluid through the channels in that area as they should. Then we're going to look for the first area of drainage, which is going to be in the suboccipital area. Then we're going to look for the second area of drainage, which is just inferior to the ear or mastoid process. And our third area is going to be down into the upper portion of the chest. Now, one little key for you, when it comes to treating, very often we recommend that you open up the base and then work your way back. Why? Remember I used the analogy of a plumber, if the water won't go down in your sink, he doesn't play around in the sink, he actually goes down underneath and checks the pipes. Same thing with the cranium. If you work the cranium, if you work the venous channels, if you ensure that the cranium drains properly, but we have restriction in the area of the jugular veins and the corroded arteries and the upper thoracic region, there's going to be nowhere for the fluid to go. And this is when you can get kind of backup symptoms of people talking about post-nasal drip or coughing or choking. And so it makes sense to open up this area, this area, and then come to the cranium last. This is just a little key that I have noticed over the years and that I recommend that people do when it comes to treating and facilitating cranial venous drainage. Okay, I'm now going to demonstrate for you how to do a CV4 technique. We talked about it a lot and now is the time for us to take a look at it. Now you'll see that many different practitioners recommend doing a CV4 in different ways. They may talk about just wanting to increase extension. Some of them talk about going into increasing flexion and extension. It stands to reason I prefer to have an effect on both. So with the CV4, what are we trying to do? Is we're trying to open up the area of drainage of the third and fourth ventricle. So what we're going to do is we're going to cross our hands Remember that our occiput is going to be resting on our thenar eminence on either side and therefore the cranium is actually going to be resting on your hands like this. So the first thing to be able to do is to cross your hands, I often say, as if you were cupping a baby bird. Our occiput is going to be resting on our thenar eminence and we're going to be bringing our hands together, so it's actually quite a strong muscular movement with your hands to compress and to open up and extend. So what we're doing is we're following the occiput. As it goes into flexion, we're going to compress the occiput to augment that pumping and increased flexion. And as it comes into extension, we're going to open out our thenar eminence to open up the area and pull back during extension in order to facilitate extension, thereby allowing the fluid to drain. So let me show you what that looks like. First I'm going to 
get my patient's head to just rest on my hand as I showed you. I already ascertained with her where the bony landmarks of her occiput are. So it's important that my treatment not be global like this. We're not doing a global vault hold. We're doing a very specific technique. So notice my hands are very cupped. And I'm going to cross and cup one hand on top of the other. I'm going to make sure that either side of the thenar eminence of my hand is only on the occiput. Make sure that I'm not squeezing the area close to the mastoid. Make sure that I'm not on the temporal. And now once I have my hands in this position, I'm just going to take a little bit of time to wait and listen. And I'm going to follow the occiput inflection and extension for a couple of cycles to get an idea of the amplitude of her cycles. So now I can feel that her occiput is going into flexion and you can just relax your head, let it fall. Okay. So I'm just following that phase of extension. You can see we're going a flexion. We're going in and then I'm going to kind of lean back a little bit and follow it as it comes back out into extension. Okay, so now I have a bit of an idea of her overall speed and rhythm. Now as she goes into flexion again, what I'm going to do is I'm going to augment that flexion and I'm also going to squeeze the palms of my hands together so that I'm bringing together my thenar eminence. So what I'm doing is that I'm inducing even more of a kind of contraction. So let your head move, okay? I've got one hand cupped on top of the other. I'm right down at the occipital base. And as she goes into flexion, I'm going to augment that flexion and I'm going to squeeze. Then as she comes into extension, I'm going to open out my hands and I'm going to pull backwards. And I'm actually, I'm not doing a full cervical traction. My intention is specifically on the occiput. I'm pulling back and I am increasing the physical range of the occiput in extension. And I'm actually going to hold it for a longer period of time. And you might find that there's some resistance of it going into extension at the beginning. That's okay. We're going to do this a few cycles. We're going to follow it again into flexion. We're going to squeeze our thenar eminences together. So we're actually compressing the occiput a little bit in flexion. And then as we're going into the extension phase, we're going to lean back and we're going to pull and we're going to open out our hands. And we're going to pull and increase that phase of extension for an even longer period of time. And I feel like I'm having to pull so hard. And look, even her head is going off on its own little myofascial unwinding. <laughs> so we're going to let go of that extension. We're going to let it come back into flexion again. And extension. We're going to pull and lean back in our chair. So that's our CV4 technique. When you choose to apply that within your treatment is going to be up to you. You might have found that beforehand, maybe you wanted to open up the muscles and the area in between the cranial base and the first cervical vertebrae. So you might need to come in and do some suboccipital decompaction. Right, and here's where what we're going to do is we're going to get the base of our occiput, we're going to get down right underneath it, and we're going to put our fingers very straight, straight like arrows. We're trying to open up the space between the occiput and the top of the cervical spine. So notice I'm going to get in there, and now her head is resting only on my fingertips. You see, I could move her head around if I wanted using just my fingertips. You're going to find that your hands are going to get very strong using these techniques. These are our two most important techniques that you need to learn and master as you're working on trying to improve drainage of the cranial venous sinus system. Now she's an excellent case for this because I can find that there's actually a lot of compacted tissue in there. So I've had clients where sometimes I have worked on doing a CV4 technique for almost the entire duration of our treatment. 
and clients often get up and they feel a lot more relieved, more energetic, clearer complexion, all of the signs of the fact that we now help to facilitate blood flow out of the cranium into the rest of the body. We've reduced intracranial congestion. So you might find that you need to come back and do work on this several times. It's not something that you can do all in one session. And in fact, you can actually over-treat this area in one session. You don't want to bruise the area or trigger inflammation of the tissues. You want to open up so it can drain. So if you find a client like this that needs this technique a lot, you might need to cover come in weekly if you're doing it as part of an overall body treatment protocol or if you're doing cranial work itself. If you do your full assessment and then you assess for the venous system, you'll probably find that you have your work cut out for you. So I hope you enjoyed watching this video and now that you have, take the time with your clients, practice a little bit, practice that CV4, it takes time and with time in a rhythmic fashion you'll be working within the cranial rhythm of your client and you'll see that she'll get up saying, wow I feel a lot better.